Welcome to Mark Hummel's Blues Harmonica Party. I'm in the UK right now, playing in London, and uh, I'm interviewing my friend uh, Big Joe Lewis, who was uh, I, I met way back, way Long back in, in 1993, I think, or wow. 92, something like that. Yeah, when I went over to uh, Brussels and played that yeah, Brussels yeah, Blues Festival, yeah. So uh, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, Joe's career in the blues in the UK and and a lot of the different people you got to work with and mm -hmm. your thoughts and feelings about uh, the blues and how, uh, I guess, where your vision is of, of blues. I mean, you're, you're kind of mm -hmm. like me, it seems like, in the sense of... You, you uh, like the older styles. Yeah, I listen to, <clears throat> I guess, the older styles, but, you know, music moves on. And mm -hmm. I would say to people that if I was a jazz fan in the 20s, right. you know, I wouldn't recognize Miles Davis or Keith Jarrett. Right. You know, to me, that wouldn't be jazz. But, you know, music just moves on. And yeah. You find what you like and then yeah. you adapt to it. Yeah. And I just do what I do. Yeah. And... I don't feel any much connection with what people do now. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that's fine. That. I don't yeah. know, that's, yeah. that's fine. You know, I'm happy yeah. to do my thing. And... Right. Well, I ha just tell me how you got into uh, into the blues and, and, and what your early experiences were with it. Well, <clears throat> you know, when I came came to, to Europe, you know, uh, as a child, it's from... Uh, from Jamaica. And I was oh, really? Born and raised it. So, wow. you know, we grew up listening to a whole different type of music. You know? Right. Obviously, reggae music and soul. We used to have Jackson 5 cartoons and, mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff was right. was big. You know, we didn't have Rolling Stones and all that right. sort of thing. So I came here and um, that was what people were into. Like, it was the hard rock for the Led Zeppelins and the, right. all that kind of stuff. And I, just wasn't your thing, huh? Well, I couldn't find, you know, music easily from back home. It was more <coughs> difficult. And um, so I was searching around. I'd go to gigs and see people. And, you know, one night I'd go and see Sylvester. You know, he was a disco right. artist. The next night might be The Clash. And it was right. kind of like, yeah, okay. And then, I don't know why, my mother got me a double album by Skip James. Really? Yeah, it was now, were you a teenager at this point? Yeah, yeah, I was yeah. like I was sixteen. Yeah, and um, I thought, oh, this is this is deep. And then I got a compilation album called All the Blues All the Time, and it had Howling Wolf Summer, um, House Rock and Blues. Right. And Good evening, everybody. This is Wolf coming to you. Yeah, right. and that was it. I was just oh, oh wow. <clears throat> It's interesting the way, I mean, you know, your story, I think all of our stories are so similar in the sense of that, you know, as teenagers, we'd hear this and we, and there would be just something that would like jump out and grab us. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, everyone I've ever talked to, that's kind of the deal, you know? Yeah, it, it was. The, <clears throat> the other thing was that um, when I got to be about in my early twenties, I became a crazy record connector. Right. So I was buying 78s. Mostly 78s and 45s too. And I fell in with a bunch of older record collectors. Uh -huh. I mean, like, I was 20, they were like 35, and they, they'd done everything, and they'd seen, you know, Muddy come over, James Cotton in 62 or whatever, and they'd been all around, and they knew so much, and they would, you know, he was I wanting to buy Walter Davis records or Babyface with you all right. Yeah, and they were like, oh, yeah. okay, oh. Do, you, do you know John Brim? Right. Oh, no, okay. Oh, right. oh, yeah. They're and turning the honest. Yeah, and in those days, you know, before the internet and before everything was available on CD, four CDs, um, if I wanted to hear Country Jim or, I don't know, Jesse Thomas, that was how you, you, would, you would hear them. You had to buy the records. And so I never heard it through other, you know, a lot of people came to it because they might have heard Paul Butterfield or right. whatever. Right. And I never really heard it through that kind of thing. Others, I, never, yeah. I never kind of understood yeah. why would I listen to this person do a copy of Otis Rush? Right. <laughs> that was my attitude. Because yeah. there's Otis Rush. Yeah. Right. Think, well, right. Yeah. Why yeah. would I listen to Eric? Why would I copy Eric Clapton's Hideaway when I can copy Freddie King's? 
Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, I was always more interested. You know, to me, whether somebody was really well known or not didn't make a difference to me. Right. So, to me, Charlie Booker, or um, you know, there's early Lowell Ferguson records, just right. him and Martin. Right. Oh, that's guitar. awesome stuff. That was to me was just as good as the throw has gone. Right. You know, it, it moved me as much. And yeah. So yeah. I just started digging, 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 and buying all these records and listening and learning. Yeah, and that's that's what happened. Yeah. And so, uh, so you were were you playing guitar at this point, or? Yeah, yeah. I started off as a saxophone player. Oh. Okay. Gave that up very very quickly because you can't do both. You can't sing and play. Right. Saxophone. Right. Um, so I started playing guitar. I had a, a partner, King David. We played two guitars, and w one would play the bass, and the other would play the, the top part. Right. We did that, and we didn't know any other musicians. You know, we didn't know harmonica players or drummers. Or, right. You know, all the drummers were like rock players. And, now, were you in London at this point? No, I was in Kent, a little in place Kent. on the coast. Right. And uh, <clears throat> so for years, you know, we were just playing duos, and then I moved to London and put a band together, and uh -huh. that's where it took off. Got double bass, you know, I'd never seen right. a double bass player before. Right. And uh, yeah, met, met some really good harmonica players. Yeah. yeah. So was this the 80s? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. yeah. And what was it What was it called? What was the name of the band? Big Joe Lewis. And his Blues Kings. And his Blues Kings. Yeah. So it's always yeah. been that name. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, when did you hook up with Little George? Late 80s? Yeah, about 88. Okay. I believe, yeah. Um, I was playing with a harp player and he left. And um, we used to play a, a jam session for harp players. We'd be the backing band. We really? Along. Wow. And George came along and he'd not been playing too long, but you know, there was something about him. Yeah. And we just heard him. And he sang as well, which was right. rare for all of us. Right. I don't need to tell you. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so when when my other heart player left, I, I asked George if he'd come and play. And, you know, he was just, he just got better and better and better. Well, it was really cool to have, it's so cool to have a band where you got two vocalists because it yeah. really, really expands, you know. And quite different. Yeah. Quite different and sound. you guys are such different singers. Yeah. Yeah. It was, but, uh, it was you great. guys blew me away then when I saw you in 93, mm. man. It was like, I went, damn. Good times. Yeah, these yeah, kids yeah, really yeah, can do yeah, it. Good times. Yeah. yeah. So um, so tell me about some of the old timers that you were able to play with. And, and what did you get out of, you know, playing with the old timers over here? Well, the first guy, I guess, I remember doing a show with Memphis Slim in the early 80s and just remembering how he was like a, I mean, he was a giant, like physically. Mm -hmm. He was a really big guy, and he had yeah. these these fingers that were like, but they curved at the ends like bananas, right, like, like right, that. Right. And he, it was just him and a drummer, a French guy called uh -huh. Philippe Combelle. Right. And I they, saw him they carried the show, and yeah. they were just so exciting, and it was just like a effortless but wonderful. And then. I started hanging out with Eddie C. Campbell, who was, oh, okay, you know, yeah. from, he was from Chicago. He spent right. some time in the 80s living in London. I think he had to leave Chicago in a hurry. And I heard. Um, we went to see him play, this King David and I, and we were talking to him afterwards. And he was, he was like, yeah, come around to, to my place. I'm staying, we'll talk. So we turned up with our guitars and he would tell us, to, to, did you know Magic Sam? And he was like, oh man, you know, just a new magic, but all these stories and yeah. you know the people that he used to play with, and he would show us how to play hideaway and, and play little things. And somewhere there's a tape of us sort of just like, right. oh, is that how you do it? Right. And he was really cool. But then I got into when I put a band together, we'd be asked to back people. So I think the first guy I backed was Kerry Bell yeah. in the eighties, and then we did some stuff. I mean, <clears throat> lots and lots of people like. Lazy Lester and John Primer and did some stuff with Honey Boy, um, Big Jack Johnson. Yeah, um, he was awesome. Homesick. Yeah, uh, 
you know, Big Lucky Carter, Reverend Charlie Jackson, yeah. Mud Morganfield later on, oh, okay. and Mason, um, and yeah. just a whole bunch. Benny Smith from St. Louis. Oh, yeah. yeah. And Clara McDaniel, she, she was really good too. But people, people would, I knew a lot of promoters in the States who, who work with these artists. Mm -hmm. And they call so me. So would they they'd contact you yeah. and they'd help put together yeah. tours? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Or, or festival dates. They right. coming to this festival, we bag us Booba Bones and oh, Big wow. Bad Smitty. Yeah. Those yeah, were. Yeah. Oh, that, that, was a, that, was a great, that was a great combination, man. Yeah. Well, I, we I saw Benny Carter. I, I mean, Benny, uh, what was Benny Smith? Turner? Oh, Benny what Turner. Benny Turner. I saw Benny Turner with uh, with. Uh, Big Bad Smitty. Yeah, he was the baseball player, yeah. right, Benny? He used to yeah. that one. No, 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 no. Benny, I think it was, it was it Benny Turner, the guy that from St. Louis? Was that That's Benny, Benny Smith? Smith. Okay, Benny Smith Benny was Smith. a guitar player. Who right, taught Mike. Tied up. Taught Ike. Right, Ike's yeah, right. Exactly. yeah, Benny Smith, yeah. That's what I'm I thinking played. of. And they had uh, uh, Arthur um, Arthur Williams, Paul and Hart. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Orca. Really great show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so a lot of those guys, you know, when they used to come, come over, they needed people who kind of, understood their music a bit. So did you set up tours for those guys too? No, we usually work with agents, but, okay. but, but we could connect them with people and... Right. Yeah, yeah, when, when those people was, were still here, but... Right. So what, what was your takeaway of uh, of just how... Uh, well, there's, a, there's your phone light going off. I don't know what that is, yeah. But uh, uh, what was your takeaway of working with those guys? You know, as far as like... I mean, the difference between, you know, the older black guys from, from America work, you know, working with the younger UK guys. I don't know. I think it was just like a... Was it a whole new world to you to, well, I, to be around these guys? You know, it wasn't like I'd been listening to the Rolling Stones and then all of a sudden there's this new... I, right. You know, You'd knew, already been we listening knew their to music, the genre. Yeah. But, but, you know, when you're playing with someone, you're absorbing... The music on stage rather than just right. listening to records that's, that's completely my different yeah and i can remember uh being quite surprised at some of the choices that the artists would sing yeah and so i remember d doing a show with uh, big jack johnson meets and he called steal away i go um you know steal away <laughs> you know it's getting late why can't we? Well, i didn't know that song well that's right? kind of the it's sort of the chilling circuit exactly well we it's just did thing we didn't have thing. yeah and uh and John Prime used to like to do Rhinestone Cowboy. Right. And of right. course, Lester used to love to play country music. Exactly. And so yeah. he'd say, Lonesome Fugitive, Merle Hagen. And I'd go, oh, I don't know. I have no idea. So it was good to kind of stretch you right. and, and expose you to. Right. Um, experiences you can't just learn off an old record yeah well i always thought that there was this funny thing between the english musicians or european musicians in general and then the blue skies coming over was almost a culture clash yeah you know but the thing was if you wanted to learn from it you you, you kind of absorbed what it was that they yeah. like you say i mean in a way that was an education just yeah. being able to play with these guys i yeah. mean that that was my feeling too and and, and spending you know two weeks on the road with right with Lazy Lester or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you got a whole lot of, you got a whole lot of luster. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> you know, that, that stuff is just yeah, priceless time. It is priceless because they're all gone. Yeah. Everybody we're talking about except for Primer, I think, is yeah. has departed. I saw John a couple of weeks ago. Right. He was all right. grateful. Yeah, yeah. He still sounds great. Yeah. I agree. So now you played... Also, in a band that was very popular in the UK, uh, the Big Town Playboys. Yes, I did. I did. And you joined when Mike Sanchez left. Yeah. And you were there a couple of years? Two years. Two so years. we made one record. Right. And it was a nice change of pace for me because, you know, I'm working in a band with saxophones. And mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of not what I'm used to. Hearing. No, no, well, no. But, you yeah. know, I always loved you know, people like Jimmy McCracklin right. and, and that kind of thing. and. You know, tougher. You know, Mike was more a West Coast, slightly right. smoother. You know, I couldn't ever carry a child. He was around. almost like he was almost like Amos Milburn. Yeah, Amos Milburn, yeah. Little Willie, Little Fear, right. those kind of guys. Right. Um, but 
just working, you know, they were a really good band and working yeah. with horns. It was good fun. We did some yeah. travels. Yeah. You know, quite a lot of travel. Now, was Andy Sylvester still in no, here? No, Andy had left. Andy had left okay. a few years early, which was a shame. You know, we had a great guitar player. But, yeah. was you know, I used to see the big town play boys and yeah. just watch Andy and yeah. he would like take one solo in a night. Yeah. And it was just so great. It was great. Yeah. You know, very yeah. understated and yeah. underrated. Yeah. 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 Well, that's the interesting thing to, to, uh, for me about blues is that the really, the kind of blues I think probably both of us really like is not a flashy, it's not a super flashy thing. It's not sports guitar. No, it's not. <laughs> it's not, uh, technically always adept, but there's a feel to it and there's a sense of phrasing. Yeah. It's, it's the feeling that, you know, it moves me. And so, you know, I'd rather hear, I can't remember who said it, but it's something like, you know, like one verse of Lightning Hopkins. Right. Is worth more to me than the Beatles. Everything they ever did. Right. Just, right. I can hear that. It can just like, yeah. wow, you know, more news. Yeah. Yeah. You may turn your radio on, hear the news every day, and then something about Korea, and you just go, wow, that's. Yeah. It sends chills down. You yeah. Know, you know, it's heavy stuff. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. So um, you've started doing a lot more solo stuff. Yeah, I always liked doing it. And then... Um, was that because of the pandemic? No, I was doing it before that. But, yeah. You know, I'm a full-time musician and um, it was a easy way to make a living, you know, so you can go and play at a bar, mm -hmm. turn up with an amp or house amp or whatever it is. Right. And um, I liked it. It was freeing. Just being able to play exactly what you want, speeding up, slowing down, not having to right worry about somebody else. Worry about somebody else. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I really like it. I love yeah. playing with my with my trio because they yeah. just like yeah. And you guys have all been playing together a lot. Yeah, a long time. Peter, my drummer, who's playing this guy, right. uh, I think it's about nineteen years. Wow. You know, How about Lewis? Lewis, I think he's a new guy. He's I think six, seven. Yeah. Yeah. So he's. Yeah. Still earning his money. Well, thanks for coming ah, on to Lewis Fielding. Lewis Fielding is a great yeah. guitar player. Yeah. yeah. And he, he was with George before that. Right. Exactly. That's, where, that's where he learned a lot exactly. of great stuff. Yeah. 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 So what did you, how did you make it through the pandemic? I sat and looked out of my garden, played <laughs> a lot of records. I cooked. I was grateful that I had a home. Yeah. Um, I didn't spend as much. Yeah. You know. Right. Um, it was fine. I was just lucky. I had it, I had COVID really bad at the beginning. Did you really? And um, yeah, March 2020. It, it was pretty rough. Yeah. But um, I made it through. And it was a nice summer. And I looked in my, like I say, I looked at what I had and I was, I was very blessed. Yeah. And I knew work would come back. And, you know, being a solo a guitar player, singer. You're kind of the first guy getting hired back. Yeah. You, know, you know, right? When you can't have three people on stage, you can always have one person right. on stage. And so right. that's, that worked pretty well for me. That's yeah. good. Well, it sounds like you're working a whole lot, especially the fact you got, you said the blues kitchens have been really a yes. staple yeah. for you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and other places, but the blues kitchens have been... Uh, uh, really good for not just for me but for other musicians yeah you know. yeah do you still travel uh, much in europe yeah not as much as i as i did yeah um which is is actually okay but you know mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to germany and uh, austria and maybe switzerland in a couple of months mm -hmm. and, um, a few trips here and there I've been, yeah i usually go to denmark and sweden right. every so often and um but um, sometimes it's nice, you know, I've done a lot of traveling. And sometimes it's nice to sleep in your own bed. Yes, it is. I can vouch for that. Yeah, yeah I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. 